I'm Liam. I'm Wayne. You're listening to In Film We Trust YouTube. A place where we post clips from our recent episode. All links down below in the description. And now, on with the show. <coughs> He's certainly an interesting figure, Vincent Gallo, isn't he? Painter. Motorcycle racer. Model. Actor. Musician. Real estate buys and sells, doesn't he, for profit? He said at one point that he's bought, he owns like seven million dollars worth of property, and he said he's never lost a dollar on any of them. On the speculative market. Mm, so, he's good at that anyway. Do you know what else? What else? Hip hop dancer. Is he a hip hop dancer? Prince Vince. In the 80s, he was a hip hop dancer called I've, Prince Vince. I've heard of the Prince Vince pseudonym. I never came across that. I came across like his films and his painting and. Now, <laughs> watching his films, whether mm -hmm. it's Buffalo or Brown Buddy, do any of them speak to you and say, hip-hop dancer? No, absolutely not at all. <laughs> no, it's more, it's, his films are a lot more kind of laid back and chilled, you could say, like, especially almost, the ones he directs. Almost philosophical. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't seem like hip-hop at all. And interestingly, did you ever hear of the, the there was an artist in the 80s called Jean-Michel Basquiat? No. He was in a band with him called Grey. Mm. Kind of this... Well, they because Vincent Gallo, he came from this scene, or he, he sort of came from this scene called No Wave in New York. This is what, you know, Jim Jarmusch came from, mm -hmm. filmmakers of their ilk. Because even Gallo was in a film called The Way It Is by Eric Mitchell in 1985, yeah. who also had Steve Buscemi. Yeah, I think I did see that. i seen screenshots of it, and it's kind of hard to pick him out, because like you say, we're talking young Buscemi, young Gallo. I almost find, I find Gallo hard to identify when he has no facial hair. He looks a lot different in the 80s, doesn't he? He does he, look He's a lot even different. almost borderline, like, slim muscular build, isn't he? He's not... Boyish. Yeah. But boyish. I don't think he even had, did he even have long hair at that time? No, it was short, it was... Exactly. Almost was... a crew, almost a crew cut. Not quite, but almost no, a crew cut. But it cut. was, it was hard to tell it was him. But the thing with, I find with Gallo is, do you find he's one of those people whose controversies have, in a way, overshadowed his work? I think that's almost intentional as well, isn't it? Could be. Oh. I think he's purposely doing it because I think Vincent Gallo, more than anything, I don't actually think he sees himself as a film director or no. an actor. You get these careerists, mm -hmm. whether it's your Francis Ford Coppola and that, and or Quentin Tarantino, and all of themselves that they're just a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Gallo, I think he'd be happy doing any pursuit. I don't think it's explicit to filmmaking would you describe him as a provocateur oh definitely we definitely yeah. would you not yeah i would so you're saying he's you say he's a kind of broad artist filmmaking just happens to be one of his avenues of creativity he did say and I, there was an interview maybe it was on the howard stern show and he said if he could make money any other way he would never make another film mm -hmm. so he just sees it as like a kind of means to an end really he is an artist mm -hmm. and his persona is of a public provocateur isn't it mm -hmm. i think part of that's intentional there was you know how there's obviously with vincent gallo there's almost con controversy about him being whether it's racist or anti-semitic or something and there was an interview once and somebody said to him and he says he sees people as individuals mm -hmm. he doesn't like groupthink, which i think plays an important part in vincent gallo he's a complete individualist. individualist yeah and because he hates groupthink so much he uses iconography for example from whether it's racism or you know unsavory kind of things to poke fun at those things mm. because he sees them so ridiculous because mm. he doesn't identify as a group mm, he so, sees everything purely from an individualist standard so point. it's like he's using his own individual uh, vision to shine a light on these things that he thinks are ridiculous but people have like accused him of being i think so in a way do you i think it, it, he's provoking conversation or in his mind provoking conversation yeah. to kind of break down that barrier where people group themselves into you know i'm white i'm black i'm this i'm this and i identify mm -hmm. with this he's like no you're just a human Mm -hmm. But he's like I say, he sees himself as very much as an individual. Maybe in that's an intellectualized way of seeing it, Wayne. Maybe he just likes provoking anger. Possibly, but I think, see, if you said that to him, I think he would agree with you there. And I think you could have great discourse with him because from what I've seen in interviews, he's a very articulate individual. It's not like he starts screaming profanities or whatever. He does talk to people in a very level-headed way. I've even seen in interviews where he's talking to people who dissed his films. Oh, yeah. And he still does speak some kind of a, you know, I respect your opinion, this is what I was trying to do kind of thing. So I, does, I do think he 
he does give people kind of liberty to say bad things about him, and he will argue in like a kind of very sensible way. As long as you're not Roger Ebert. No, no, <laughs> no. That was that was unbelievable because the Brown Bunny, possibly his most famous or infamous film. Infamous would you say? film, Brown yeah. Bunny, which. I don't know what um, side to believe. There, there, there's this opinion, especially by Roger Ebert, that the finish, the, the, sorry, the film at Cannes was horrendous. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cut version, because Vincent Gallo states that the version at Cannes Film Festival, it was incomplete. The, mm -hmm. the, I think it was the producers, maybe the Japanese producers, I can't remember the, the national origin. They they insisted on it premiering at Cannes, so Gallo had to rush this and edit through for it to play at Cannes, and there wasn't even an ending filmed on that film. No. So Roger Ebert, when he saw the finished version, not the Cannes version, Roger Ebert gave it, you know how he gave it a thumbs up or thumbs, thumbs down? down yeah. He gave it a thumbs up and said, without the, I think it was 28 minutes, was it? Yeah. Without the 28 minutes, it was a good film. Mm -hmm. But Gallo said, that's bullshit. The yeah. version... The finished version, the Khan version, was only eight minute different. Right. So these people are <laughs> trying to insinuate that it was a massively different film at Khan, mm -hmm. where it was literally just an eight minute difference but in the film. It, it's hard to know who to trust, isn't it? And it actually led to a vicious war of words where Gallo said some really horrible things about well, he, Ebert. He hexed cancer on Rodney. He did, and then Ebert came back. My, my favourite Ebert quote is about this is he said, um, I recently had a colonoscopy and I got to watch it on a camera <laughs> and he said watching that was more interesting than watching the brown bunny. Vincent Gallo actually hated, I can't remind who it was, is it Roper? Did, did Roger Richard, Ebert... Richard Roper. Also, um, Gene Siskel was his original. Yeah, partner. but I think it was Roper called it a, a steaming pile of shit. <laughs> and Gallo took more offence with Roper because he said to Ebert, I would rather have the infamy of making the worst film mm -hmm. rather than somebody saying it's a steaming pile of shit because there's curiosity in the worst film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're saying a steaming pile of shit is a criticism anyone could levy on anything with no actual analytical, critical yeah, thought. Yeah, it, it's an easy target. You just say, well, that's yeah. shit. Well, what does that mean? What does that... Exactly, but it's not like Gallo's been universally hated as an actor because he won the 2010 Volpe Cup at Venice Film Festival for a film called Essential Killings, which I'd never heard of. Essential Killing. Essential Killing, that's one. And he never, apparently never has a single line of dialogue. He plays like a terrorist who's being pursued. Yeah, an Arab ter terrorist. During, it, this would be the height, I think it was 2010, wasn't it? It was 2010, yeah. So it was kind of in the height of, you know, the war on terror and that, which is almost brave in itself to take that role on. It is, yeah. And it, it shows that the man, if you give him, you know, the good director and you give him the right material, he can turn in a good performance. There was a film not long ago, I think it was last year, called Shut In. Yeah, you saw this. I've never seen this. Yeah. And they, we should we should state this was made for a company called The Daily Wire. The Daily, Is the Daily that Ben Shapiro? Ben, ben Shapiro. It's, like a, it's a, a conservative. Right -wing conservative. It's a conservative company. news outlet. Yeah, it's actually, I didn't like the film overall, mostly because like the heroine in the film is not very bright and it's, it's very right. hard to buy what's going on. But Gallo's in it. He plays, he plays a paedophile, but it's a very stripped down, very raw performance. He's not in it a lot but it never feels like he's just playing himself. It feels like he's putting a lot of effort into it. And it was his first film in 10 something years. And did, I'm sure I remember you telling me in private, you actually thought he was the best part of the he film. He was the best part of the film, definitely. 